Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Haley Seppa. I work with the CSU Entertainment Alliance, which is an initiative created to help any and all CSU students get their foot in the door of the entertainment industry. Um, in a little bit, I will be posting our website and social media links in the chat. Please check them out. We have a ton of resources, events, free opportunities, et cetera, available for you. Um, we also have a low cost internship course, free summer housing program, grants, internships and job listings. So make sure you take a look through our site and our social media when you get a chance. Uh, and with that, we can get on to why we're really here today. Um, this is our second panel with Warner Brothers and I know it's gonna be a really interesting one uh, because our panelists are some leading industry experts in their field of production design. Um, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the Matrix franchise and how much goes into these films. So it should be a really interesting insight into this part of filmmaking that we don't often get to see or discuss in depth. Um, and we're going to spend about 40 minutes in conversation and then we'll dive into Q&A from you folks. And my colleague Francesco will be popping back on screen to help facilitate that part. Um, I'm sure you all have amazing questions, so please be sure and type them into the Q&A box because we won't be able to scroll back in the chat for them. Um, in a minute, I'm going to play the Matrix Resurrections trailer for you. Uh, and then our moderator, Nate Thomas, will introduce us to our esteemed panelists here today uh, and get, get us on the road. But I wanted to make sure that first we introduce Nate uh, and give a big thank you to him, Warner Brothers, and our panelists for being here today. We are really, really grateful for you all coming together to make this happen. Um, uh, so with Nate, who's our moderator today, for those of you who don't know him, he's an incredible human uh, who has directed and produced numerous film projects, including award-winning PBS documentaries, TV commercials, public service ads, feature films, IMAX films, etc. Uh, he's even won an Emmy for a PSA television campaign he did for the FBI. Um, and I'm very proud to say that Nate is also a tenured professor of cinema and television arts at CSU Northridge, where he heads the film production program. Nate has been with CSUN for about 32 years and has been honored with a ton of university, community, and industry awards. So I can think of nobody better to run this panel and be here with you today. Um, he will be coming on to introduce our panelists right after we play the film trailer. Again, if you have questions, please be sure to put them in the Q&A box for the panelists. And if you have questions about other things, please feel free to reach out to me directly. And on that note, I really hope that you enjoy the panel and let's get going with this trailer. Thomas, you seem particularly triggered right now. Can you tell me what happened? I've had dreams that weren't just dreams. Am I crazy? We don't use that word in here. Time to 
fly. If you want the truth, Neo, you're going to have to fly me. The only thing that matters to you is still here. I know it's why you're still fighting and why you will never give up. You don't know me. No? Going back to where it all started. Back to the Matrix. All right, Nate, the show is yours. First of all, uh, thank you, Haley, for that introduction. It, it, I, I didn't deserve all of that, but uh, but I'll take it anyway. <laughs> anyway, I too would like to uh, say welcome to everybody. And it is such an honor to moderate this panel today. And I actually got a chance to see an advanced screening of The Matrix Resurrections and in IMAX. It's a good film, lots of fun and visually stunning. So I don't think any of The Matrix fans will be let down uh, by the film. So. Let's not delay this, let's get started. And I first like to introduce our special guests, Mr. Hugh Badeup and Mr. Peter Walpole, the production designers for the film. So let's talk about uh, Hugh and Peter. Hugh Badeup started in the film industry as a construction laborer in Australia on a film called The Man from Snow Snowy River. He worked in this capacity and later as a construction manager on Australian television shows and feature films before landing his first job as an art director in 1989. Hugh continued for a decade in this role on more than 15 Australian and foreign films, such as Muriel's Wedding, Angel Baby, and The Matrix. Hugh has since been a supervising art director on numerous productions, including The Matrix Reloaded, The Matrix, Matrix Re Revolutions, Superman Returns, and Speed Racer. Cloud Atlas was his first feature film as a production designer. He has since production designed the feature films Jupiter Ascending for Warner Brothers, The Shallows, and I Am Mother. These films were shot in Europe, the United States, and Australia with wide ranging budgets. Hugh, Hugh also designed series one and series two of the highly successful Netflix series Since Eight, which filmed in 14 cities and locales around the globe, utilizing a small core traveling team and full art department teams in each country. These experiences have established Hugh as truly the international production designer. He has spent much of the past two years working on The Matrix Resurrections, which was started pre-COVID, interrupted for a few months, and luckily completed before Berlin went into lockdown early last November. Hugh currently is working on a feature film in Sydney, Australia. Peter Wildpole was originally known as one of the UK's most respected and sought after set directors, decorators. He has worked with many notable directors, but his collaboration with Alana and Lily Wachowski on nine separate projects, starting as set decorator, supervising art director, and moving to production designer that he is most proud of. Peter production designed since eight, the finale as a two and a half hour movie and a closure to the popular TV series, it was shot in Naples, Paris, Belgium, and Berlin, directed by Lana Wachowski and produced by Grant Hill. Peter has worked in over 30 countries across the globe from England to Australia on such films, including Star Wars, A Phantom Menace and Attack of the Clones, Alien vs. Predator, 
V for Vendetta, Speed Racer, Cloud Atlas, Jason Bourne, and the highly acclaimed television Netflix television series Sense8. Recently, Peter was hired as the production designer on the Amazon Amblin project, Cortez, which was set in 1520. After six months of intensive research, set designs, and location scouting in and around Mexico City, the project was put on hold. Peter was then available to continue his collaboration with Wachowski. Wachowski's on The Matrix, newest installation, The Matrix uh, Resurrections. As the co-production designer, he has spent 18 months designing and shooting in San Francisco and Berlin. Peter won the best production design for Sense8 from the British Film Designs Guild. He has also been nominated for an Emmy for his work on Dinotopia and recently received a nomination from the Art Directors Guild for his work on Cloud Atlas. So it is my pleasure to say welcome uh, to the uh, to the team, the production design team of the Matrix um, Resurrections. So let's um, start off uh, with a very simple question. Um, how does it feel to be a part of this legendary Matrix enterprise? You're on mute. <laughs> Is that better? There you go. I said I was gonna leave it on for the whole webinar. Um, I, I was chatting to you. I thought I'd start off on this question um, because it's a very different answer to the one that you will have. Um, I have to say um, I'm still pinching myself slightly um, to have ever been involved in such an iconic um, movie such as The Matrix. Um, I wasn't involved in any of the original ones whatsoever, so I was very much a new boy which at times is slightly intimidating um, because obviously the knowledge that Lana uh, and Hugh have um, together um, is something that one could never really catch up on no matter how many times I revisited the, uh, the movies. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's very exciting. It's an honor. It's, it's just something that I guess when I first started in the business that I never ever thought I would be doing or sitting here discussing it on a webinar. So it, yeah, for me, amazing. Um, I'm very lucky to have worked with you on so many projects and, um, and you know, we, we knew each other very well, but got to know each other even better on the Sense8 TV series um which um because obviously Hugh wasn't available I was very lucky to get a step up and um yeah the the, the rest for me is a little bit of history so yeah uh, over the moon good good um I don't know how these things work so do I start now yeah over to you Hugh <laughs> okay this is my first zoom webinar um you're doing great so far. Um, huh? <laughs> doing great so far. Yeah, well, I'm just glad your microphone on. <laughs> it, am I mute or unmute? Am I fine? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, right. So, yeah, I'll just add to what Pete said. You know, I mean, I was involved in um, all three previous um, films and um, extremely lucky to get to the gig on the uh, first Matrix as an art director. And then they <clears throat> be um, doing the supervising art direction on um, the uh, second and the third film. Owen Patterson, whom I worked with for a long time um, before, I, I knew for a long time on and off before The Matrix uh, came along, was um, given the job by the Wachowskis to oversee the uh, first Matrix film, which I must say, just in terms of the scale of films that we'd worked on, um, was immense. Uh, it, nothing had sort of been done like that. We'd, we'd made the first three mostly in Australia. Nothing had been made like that in um, Sydney before the first one. And when Lana and Lily turned up with their <clears throat> concept art and their storyboards, uh, myself, Owen, and the other art director, Michelle McGay, were put in a room with four 
big folders of concept art and um, uh, and um, storyboards and said, okay, this is what we want to do. Now, we were a little bit like ducks in a pond. We had our little heads and bodies above the water, but our feet were going like crazy under the water going, how the hell are we going to do this? So to start off with that, and then we did the next two films in the combination of San Francisco and, um, and Sydney. Over, we filmed the next two in um, like something like 253 days shoot. Um, and then to be bought, uh, asked to come back on Resurrections after what it's now 23 years, uh, it was, uh, it, um, I mean, I don't really know how to describe it. Um, quite an experience to come back and do a film which is very, very much in the same vein as uh, the, the Matrix. So I don't know how you explain that as far as feelings go, but I was very thrilled to do it. And um, hopefully if people manage to get along to the cinema to see it, they'll, um, they'll think it was worthwhile, worth the effort. So that's been my experience. I don't know whether that answers the question, but. Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Let's get a little more insight into your, your specific role as production designers on Resurrections. So whoever wants to start. Hey, Dustin. Um, <laughs> one's got to remember that the, the history behind us both working with Lana. So there's a, a, a huge collaboration from day one um, where we were in San Francisco in what was referred to the cloud office, um, where um, I, I would suggest that, you know, the three of us worked um, continually from the script and from Lana's input and her her desire to have the sets or the action or whatever she wants from the script. And that was then um, sort of um, uh, put into the hands of the concept artists. And during that period, it was molded into, into the movie. Um, and that's where Hugh, myself and Lana spent I don't know, four months was it, Hugh, or long yeah, five, five months all up up there. Um, you know, really getting a handle on the script and then transposing that into a you know a, a, a visual medium. Hmm. Yeah. By the time we finished, um, we had all the walls of the office, you know, probably fifty meters of wall space with the concepts, and by the time we finished in that on that 28th floor Lana wanted to put it up there because she wanted San Francisco to be part of the film we tried to get the fog of San Francisco to play a part unfortunately the weather didn't you know, didn't do what Lana wanted the weather to do when we came to film but that was the whole idea to be in the clouds in San Francisco to help she had a corner office and while she was like concepting the movie with everybody would sit there and and um you know get inspiration from the city and i think when you see the uh san francisco part of the film you you know the part where she concepted that it'll, it'll be fairly obvious that part of that is the part of the character of the film for her is san francisco in in terms and none of the other films have been set anywhere specifically in the Matrix, where this one she wanted it particularly to be in San Francisco. Um, and, 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 what I, I, and what I was able to report back to Hugh about was the fact that having seen the movie uh, myself four or five weeks ago, because I don't know if if the people who are listening realize that um, Nate, you've seen it, but Hugh's uh, unfortunately hasn't had a chance to see it yet. Uh, I was able to get over to Berlin, but the concept and designs that were up on the wall in the cloud office, all 50 meters, all the way round and round again. What we had up on the wall is the movie that you go to see at the cinema or, or on, on the uh, TV eventually. Um, 
which, which is, is it exciting in itself because mm. the process of that design period um, worked because it, it, it's in the film. You know, from the moment you walked into the beginning of the office, you saw the start of the film all the way around to walking out and that was the end of the film. And that's what you see when you go to watch it. And like, because we've worked with, like Lana worked with uh, Peter and um, in and Peter was the set decorator. I think V for Vendetta was the first one, Pete, was not over there yep. in Berlin. And like we've known, I'm, I'm probably repeating a few things here, but just for, for the people who don't know us. So we've worked together for quite a long time now. And when Lana, um, when we were working on Sense8, we'd sometimes try and get Lana to come and have a look at our sets. Yeah, have a look, because mostly it was locations, but any time we had to do something, we'd say, do you want to come and have a look at this? Check it out. And Lana would say to both of us, she's like, if it's what we talked about, then I'll come and shoot it. Um, and so we had a really good, well, we still have a really good relationship with Lana. And by the time we'd finished the concept work on the floor, um, we had concept artists, you know, from the first one, Jeff Darrow came back, Steve Scrache, Tani Tunakani, who were all like go way back with Lana um, to when they were trying to get the first film, get Matrix up. So she wanted, she would sit with the concept artists with Peter and I looking over shoulder, having a chat for, she'd go around two or three times a day to the 13 of them in the office and as Peter just said, by the time we, we had finished the five months, we had the film on that wall. And when Peter was in San Francisco and I went to, to Berlin, we just took all the concept work and then put it up on different office walls and we could explain to people, they would say, what's the film going to look like? And we could go, well, there, look at this. This is what it is. And if you could go along that wall with a video camera and then watch the film, you would see that the film is exactly what, you know, we set out in that five months to, uh, to achieve. So that was, that was that process. And Lana and Lily have done that process all the time. They just want to know when their design process is done, that's the other things to do, move on, send us out, and they turn up and they know what they're going to get which is a great bit of advice for any budding production designers out there who might be listening to what Hugh said with regards to Lana discussing with both of us. If that's what we've discussed, then that's what I'll shoot. Um, and I think there are instances within this industry where a director might be thinking that they're gonna walk onto a set that they've discussed and it turns out to be slightly different. And um, that's, a big issue for everybody concerned then because you haven't followed through with the wishes of a, a director that you're you're designing for so i think that's a great point that hugh made and i think you know you know if if uh, if the people who are listening um take that on board as one of their things to move forward with then that would be pretty good mm. well thank you so now um of course many students as well as others uh, more often than not, they don't understand the difference between a production designer and an art director. Uh, would you like to explain the difference for us? I'll let you do that one, Hugh. Okay, okay. Um, well, uh, before, I mean, in, 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 in Hollywood years ago, the production designers working for the studios would be the head of art departments. And they may have five movies that they were the production designer on and they would go around and have concept artists on each film and then have art directors. And so the design, the, back in the day, they were the people who did the drawings, oversaw all the artwork and things like that. As it progressed, um, especially in smaller films, art directors were art directors stroke designers. So on a small feature film, for instance, um, the Muriel's Wedding and the Big, the Big Steel in Australia, they were some of the first films that the actual art director 
they said, well, the art director's job is too big now. So they separated the design process from the art direction. And then also you have the conceptual design and then you have the production design and the art direction really is the, the supervising art director is a, is a role because you have a big enough show that has four or five art directors. And, and when Pete was also set decorating, it's the same sort of role as the set decorator. He would have four or five people under him who would he would then delegate to. And the art directors are in charge of like getting the drawings actually done, getting the budget, having the construction, getting the detail onto the drawings, then up the chain of command to the supervising artist, and then takes them to the designer who signs off on them. But the nuts and bolts of the show get done from art direction down. And also with set deck, I'm speaking for Pete here, but under Peter, he would have the same hierarchy. So you deal with the production designer, but your tentacles as art director or set decorator go out a lot further. Whereas if the production designer really has to concentrate on what the design is and the films are so complicated and big and with visual effects that the designers really don't want to worry, will have no, no time to worry about what the budget is and who's going to do what, where and when. So that's the, the, the production designer role and the set decorator role. Often, you know, they collaborate mostly and then with the director and then under that you have the worker bees that basically get everything done and hopefully on time. So that's basically, it's a, it depends on the size of the film. You know, if you were working on a small budget film and they called you the production design, you probably didn't have enough money to actually design the film because you'd probably be the art director. And you would, if you're lucky enough, you could have a set decorator and, and you would have to do the whole thing. But as they get bigger, the roles become different, you know. Um, but working on little films as, Pete and I have both done in the past, you learn a lot about how to do each of the roles. Um, and, and that's really the best way to do it. Um, unless you've art directed uh, or you've been set decorator, it's, I think it's a little bit different than that. You don't really know the ins and outs. As a production designer, you've got to know how everybody does everything. You just don't have to oversee it all the time. I think that's how I go, right? Uh, very good. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with everything. You so know. if I'm not Dad, making sense, yeah. <laughs> sorry, Nate, if I'm not making sense, it's just I'm, you know, it's a bit early in the morning and I'm trying to, um, I was a bit blown out by the uh, watching that trailer in, at 7 a.m. in the morning. It just sort of like, Brought back a lot of, um, you know, it was quite a big job for Pete and I, Resurrection. So I was sitting here at 7 a.m. watching a trailer with that music and it was fairly emotive. So it's sort of just woken me up. So I'll get in full swing in a minute. Anything you want to add, Peter, to that question? Uh, no, I, I think that that's it. You know, um, it's the tentacles underneath the production designer. Um, and sometimes, you know, um, the supervising art director and set decorator work closely together to maybe protect the designer from stuff that, it, it, you know, is maybe going not quite so well as it should be or trying to work out problems uh, and leave them to get on with doing what um, they do best. And that's designing the movie um, in the hope that they don't try to interfere with the art direction or the set decoration too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yes. You don't want them in your pocket. No. They, you have to make you have to make them think you are. Yeah, and of course, <laughs> we never interfere in anybody <laughs> having done those jobs before. No, no, never, never. But also, just to add, as production designer too, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you have a lot of uh, input to other departments. You know. Um, you liaise with the stunt department and, you know, and through them, because a lot of these films, especially Resurrections and films like Resurrections, the interaction with the art department um, is immense because every time an actor has to touch something in a fight scene, it has to be soft. 
and it has to break. And so our art directors, um, they deal on a practical level with that those departments to make sure it gets done and, and is in the right place at the right time. But we as production designers have to be sure that when we do something like that, it it because our main job is to make sure it looks good. A stunt department's main job is to make sure the stunt looks good. So sometimes those areas have to be um, finessed, Pete, wouldn't you say? Yeah, totally. No, um, I, I agree. Very good. So now, since the introduction of the original uh, and the, the previous Matrix installments, the technology obviously has changed, including the capture formats. So in the old days, in the earlier, uh, the original Matrix would have been shot on 30, 35 millimeter film. And now we're dealing with digital capture. And as well as the, the visual effects have changed in the way that they are done. Um, in the Matrix Resurrections, what were the advantages or challenges to this change as far as production design? Um, I, I had to read that question a couple of times actually when, um, when you sent them through because um, I, because we're in it, you don't kind of think about it so much now. You know, it's become a way of life. You and I were talking about this earlier on this evening or his morning. Um, I mean, in the early days, um, you know, the digital world was so unforgiving uh, and, and, you know, one had to be so specific about finishes and, and textures and the look. Um, whereas now it's become a norm. So you don't tend to think about that so much. It just becomes your way of life. You know, you, you know it's going to be shot digitally. So you work accordingly. Um, I don't know. I think Hugh would agree with me. It, the, the Resurrections was, Lana has a particular way of shooting, um, which uh, uses a steady cam uh, a great deal of the time, which she developed during the Sense8. It was her style, which she has taken over and has made that movie, uh, made this movie in that way, um, which I think you, I, I suspect she's one of the few directors to do that. I mean, one or two of the actors have made statements to, you know, to various um, publications um, with the surprise of how she went about shooting it. And of course, digitally, um, you can run the camera a lot longer um, until you run out of memory rather than wasting, you know, many feet of, um, of, um, of film. So, um, it's a twofold question that I think one is that I personally am very used to the digital world now, but secondly, the way she shot this movie, I believe is very different to how other directors might shoot um, a, a, a similar movie. Would you agree, Hugh? Yeah, it definitely also with the, um, the matrix, um, as I said, the storyboards and the concept work was done. And it, when you, anyone who's going to see Resurrections should spend a, a couple of hours watching um, Mate, The Matrix because it's completely, uh, the, the, the Resurrections is a bookend to The Matrix, but the visual style is completely different. The F Matrix was very, every frame was very like a graphic image and the camera moved on dollies and on cranes and the storyboards were the storyboards and that's what the film looks like. It looks like a series of graphic images put together. And, and that's what their style, Lana and Lily's style was with the first three films. Um, and you can see that, but when, as Peter just suggest, said, that on Sense8, she changed her shooting style on Sense8 and... Um, was very intimate with the actors and to, to shoot Sense8 in the period of time we had to do, Lana had to change the style. There was no time to set up a dolly, set up a crane. She had just went in and had a great um, Steadicam operator who actually then became the DP when we moved to Berlin because COVID made us make a few changes. But she would have her shoulder on the back of the Steadicam operator and just keep moving around and to get the shots and then worry about 
crossing the line or getting other people in uh, in frame when it came to post production. Now, she couldn't have done that had we been using film cameras. It just wouldn't have been able to be done. And I think the technology that Peter was talking about is like in the early days, I remember when we I uh, did a show, Superman Returns in quite a long time ago when they first, that was the first time they use digital cameras and they, they didn't really, it was an experiment. And so the problem with the art department was that they had such a depth of field that everything was in focus from, you know, a foot in front of the camera to a hundred yards. And so it made life very <laughs> difficult for set decoration and construction and paint because the camera could pick up everything. And since then, they've actually, the techniques of using the camera now um, have obviously been, you know, that was like 14 years ago or something like that. They shoot it completely differently and, 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 it, and they get the depth of field right. And it, I think that people, as Peter just said, we've now been working with it for so long, it just becomes, that's how we have to do it. And I think for the new, new generation of filmmakers, I don't think they'll ever get to work with film. So they will just learn what digital is. And visual effects have changed, you know, so much that the digital world has really helped them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think. How did the production design and, and visual structure of Resurrections intersect with the story structure? Hey, Pete, I think we did that one in number two, didn't we? Did we yeah, that's all about being in the cloud and working with Lana and the conceptual period okay. and and um, um, uh, and making it work with the script, I think. Okay. Yeah, and I think, as Pete and I we were talking to ourselves earlier, you know, by doing it on the 28th floor in, in, um, in the location, I mean, there was a push to... Um, remember, Pete, there was a push to go to LA to do the concept work, you know, and Lana was very much to get the story integrated with the environments, wanted to be able to go to location recce's in San Francisco where we would be filming so that we could do the design work based on where we were going to be. Um, and so I guess that is how that it, it, that production design interacted with the story structure with came straight from Lana and being able to go down into the street, find a location, then go back up on, onto the 28th floor, sit around, get a, the concept artist, go, okay, we're going to shoot this from this angle, we're going to do this from here, and then be able to put that in, as I said, as Pete and I both said, when, when you see the film, if you can see the concept art, here's the bit of concept art, here's the film. Mm -hmm. So I think that might answer that question. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we can't give away any plot or story points, uh, but is there a favorite sequence, as far as production design is concerned, that really resonates with you or that you're most proud of in, in this film? Pete, you start. Okay. Um, yeah, tricky one, actually. Um, I would have to be slightly broader than that. I mean, for me... <laughs> the whole movie actually falls into that category. Um, um, but I loved San Francisco. Um, I love shooting in San Francisco. Some of the stuff that we did in the streets was, I've never seen anything like that done before. Um, and the streets have already been designed. That was nothing to do with me, but there was still a lot of organization. There was a lot of stuff to be put in there and to make it filmically work. Um, and as I well really, as the, roof, the, the rooftops you did too. The rooftops too yeah. were a big part of that too as well. Yeah, it? yeah, you know, uh, uh, the streets and rooftops. And then uh, having to repeat the rooftops back in um, uh, Berlin. Um, so there was stuff that we shot on in San Francisco that we then repeated um, very closely back in Berlin. Um, for me, the 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 San Francisco stuff was really something I shall um, you know take with me forever. I mean, that was exciting. It was it was um, something that I'm very proud of. 
Um, I kind of like building sets because that's where I started off in the film industry. Um, I guess if if I had a favourite, um, re the the opening of film where we sort of when the audience you know gets an idea that we're in the matrix and obviously by having a look at the new trailer there is now a in the real world a, a city which we designed and we had to have a whole new look of what the city would be um and it, i think i don't think they name it in the film but so i can't say what it is here but just that fact that building the sets and putting you know new textures and the, and the paint and the lighting um when we did the the opening sequence i really enjoyed doing that and then and the set building and for the city and and generally because i like you know I, i'm always been involved in the building of the sets um berlin was one of my you know my favorite place to be dabbling in um things that you know i mean sometimes you go to work and i know i'm digressing but sometimes you go to work and you go well this isn't really a job is it really you know and um, when you get to do a show like Resurrections, uh, it's very hard to have a favourite part of it, mm -hmm. I think. I agree, yeah. yeah. Very good. Now, we all know the industry took, uh, well, the worldwide industry took an obvious break during the COVID pandemic. Any unique circumstances in your workflow as a result of that pandemic, or which is still going on? But any unique cir circumstances or anything that you guys had to alter in that workflow because of the COVID pandemic? Hey, Pete, I think we were pretty lucky with that the timing, weren't we? They they yeah. did they did close us down when they they closed Batman down, which was filming in trying to film in London. We were pretty close to we'd finished filming in San Francisco, hadn't we, Pete? Yeah, I was I was only back in Berlin for one week, so we yeah. we shut San Francisco down. We decamped, um, and um, I, I think I followed Lana on. Uh, I was about four or five days later, and then we were in Berlin for a week when it, everything broke. Yeah, I've been in Berlin for a few months at that stage, and we were filling up the stages with sets, um, and and. I mean, in, in one respect, COVID gave us a little break because the, the company moved from San Francisco to Berlin and we were supposed to only have like a week and a half or two weeks yeah. pre-production. Yeah, um, yeah, Two weeks before they moved into the stages and um, and started filming. And we then we filmed for like, you know, 14 weeks in the stages. So one day the Warner Brothers just said, okay, force majeure, you know, everyone go home. and um, and we just, they told us on Wednesday and then on, I think by Friday, we we were all we were heading home out. because they just, you know, they had to close down. No one knew what was going to happen. And, and But we were fortunate, weren't we, really? Because we only came home for two months and and, yeah. and Berlin had, had, uh, had a really, in the first wave, had their COVID not under control, but in a way that they allowed us to come back and continue working. So when Pete and I got back to Berlin, we got back a little earlier than everyone else. And because for us, we had sets being built and painted and things like that, we just, our, our construction team and all our art department in Berlin were locals, we were able to just continue. Whereas when the production came back, they were forced into like re- evaluating everything um how you do the protocols how you you know how we interact with each other how we you know how we sit in a tent to have lunch how we have a meeting so it gave us and they then said okay well listen when there's no way in a week from now we're going to start shooting again um um so they pushed the shoot for i think six weeks um and and because of COVID, Daniele uh, took over being the director of photography and, and his team had to get used to that. So it had a big impact, but in the end, I have to be selfish and say, you know, as far as the film goes and, and our job, um, 
we ended up having a lot more time to do a, do the sets than we thought we would would do and everybody else i mean the protocols that they had to put in place when they came back were no one well as we know no one had done it before so we would th i think maybe warner brothers second movie back um and so the production had a lot of lot of problems just trying to figure out how we we're going to do the film didn't they yeah, I think we were the second movie back, but we were the only one to continually keep going um, because I think Batman came back sometime after uh, at the same time, but then got shut down again. I can't remember. Um, yeah. But our, our, our protocol was very well organised. Um, and also uh, the schedule changed, didn't it, Hugh? Because what they did was um, they started off with sets that had less people in. So yeah. all the fight stuff was put to the back end. All the all the all the big crowd scenes were put to the back end of the schedule. So the schedule picked up momentum with more and more people. So there, there were you know two handed scenes to begin with, that then sort of um, uh, increased. Well, and it made us. We had to change the schedule quite radically, as Peter said. So uh, a lot of the sets. We had we then had to put a lot of work and a lot of manpower into what would be a set that we would only shoot on for half a day. But whether you shoot on a set for half a day or three days, it has to look what it's got to look like. Yeah. So we did have to um, really um, get into a different gear with our construction and especially with um, the set finishing because that's the that's in the end that's what you see um so we had to import a few more we got a, a really good team of um set set finishes and scenics from um from uh rome to augment our team that we had in uh in berlin so that we could just move things along and and change the whole structure of what we'd been planning because by this stage we'd been planning the schedule for like nine months mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you're back at work and go oh by the way those eight sets that you were going to shoot in like 14 weeks we want to shoot them in three so you know but that's how features go isn't it? you know the, you know yeah you know then then you throw an act of availability <laughs> <laughs> and, and other problems so you know, and it had a fairly big impact. I'm, I guess I'm playing it down a little bit now that Peter reminds me. It probably wasn't as straightforward as I just said. But anyway. No, to us looking back, yes, it's funny. It, it seems straightforward, but it was it was a very new part and territory of filmmaking that nobody had ever done. And I think all of us uh, on, on the film should be proud of the way that it was um, instrumented. Yeah, at one stage, we didn't know whether we were actually going to go back to work or not, or we were just going to send the construction team in the, with a whole lot of bins and put everything in the bins. And then we wouldn't be having this conversation. <laughs> Thank you. So you, you've both, you, you, you have both worked in television and feature theatrical releases. Is the role of the production designer different in these two mediums? I think Hugh touched on it earlier on a little bit. Um, I think on, on, on maybe on, on the TV shows, some of them are a little bit smaller maybe, and you, you tend to do more, you cover more areas. I know in the in the UK occasionally that, you know, designers do a little bit of decorating and, and you know, a, a little bit more organizationally minded for the um, uh, art department in the art director's role. Um, um, I think that's fair to say, isn't it, Hugh? Yeah, I think generally, to the difference in television and um, the features, well, the ones we've done, is uh, how fast you have to move on a TV show compared to... That's very you know, true. You don't get as long pre-production and um, things have to move a lot faster. So, you know, you... You know, sometimes with a set on a feature, you can, you know, as a supervising art director, I knew sometimes we repainted sets 15 times and you would, you know, and on TV, you don't. You paint it once and off you go. 
you shoot it. So it, I think it's the time frame more than anything else from my, from my experience, you know. We, yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. I've forgotten about Sense8 because that was a TV show. I, 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 I rather um, incorrectly made reference to television being smaller than, you know, some films, whereas... Whereas um, Sense8 was maybe bigger financially than some films, um, but it had the speed of, of the television shoot um, compounded with the fact of us flying around the world um, at the same time. Yeah, I don't think anyone would make Sense8 again. No, yeah. no, so I think we were there right at the right time actually, because it was quite something. It's got good stories to dine out on. Yeah, and um, that, and 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 that, yeah, and, I mean that's a whole n another webinar that you know that's not Matrix re Resurrection. No, that's, no, a that's, whole, that's a whole other webinar that one. But um, <laughs> I think in general television is, is your 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 time frames like crunched, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, in in the consuming of this content, um, you know, there's some that will say, well. You know, I, I don't have to go to the movie theater anymore. I, I got my my TV over there, and that's good enough. But um, there is a difference in when you're consuming it. And so again, uh, watching this film, and um, you felt uh, watching it on the big screen yesterday, you felt a part of the story, not just watching the story. And again, as I said earlier, to really appreciate all of the art direction and all of the cinematography, it was just stunning on the big screen. And I. I don't know, this film is opening in the theaters. So I, I would surely encourage everybody. It's the Matrix, you gotta see it. You gotta see it in the theater. Um, I, but I do know that I think it's opening simultaneously on HBO Max. But uh, that experience yesterday, um, it, was, it was just amazing. And so, so as far as the consumption of, of this content there, you know, there are some differences, obviously, uh, as you were saying, television is much quicker and obviously their budgets are probably much smaller than, than the big theatrical releases, but uh, hopefully everybody will see this on, on the uh, big screen. But uh, kudos to you guys. Uh, excellent movie. Uh, your work uh, shined big time, and it is an honor uh, to have you guys here. So I'd like to uh, open it up to questions from our, our viewers. And um, Francesco is going to come back. He's going to that part. There we go. Yes, Good thank night, you. Good night, mate. Hey, hi, nice to meet you guys. Thank you, Nate, for helping moderate the panel. Uh, first of all, I'd love to say just what an absolute pleasure and honor it is to be on the Zoom call with the both of you. You know, on behalf of the CSUEA and just myself personally, you know, I just want to thank you for your time today. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Um, but that's enough for me. Let's get into some of your guys' questions from the audience. And we're going to start off with um, a question that a couple of different people asked, Matt Magnus, uh, Shin Wei. Caesar, uh, they'd love to know what were the conversations like in terms of balancing what we've already seen uh, from the series and you know utilizing that nostalgia uh, while bringing new ideas and also refreshing the look. Jeez, part one, two, three, and four. <laughs> it's a whole trilogy. <laughs> no, I mean the question. There's about oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The question. The question there. is a whole franchise at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll let Pete start with that one. Well, it's easy for me because I didn't work on the other one, so I just approach this as a completely different film. <laughs> <laughs> have you Have you seen? Yeah. Uh, did you watch any of the past films to I, as no, like a reference yeah. point? I think uh, yeah. I, I think it, it would have probably been not a good move not to have seen them. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, I mean, uh, I. Even when I started on V for Vendetta, I rushed out and had a look at the Matrix again. Um, but um, yeah, oof, it's a tricky one that um, because there is definitely vibes there, but I think it's a it's a different it, it, it's it, it's not a different movie. It's a it, it's a movie which enhances the first one, uh, a continuation. Mm -hmm. um, wouldn't you agree, Hugh? It's not. Yeah. Um, the, the, the point that Lana, and pick me up anytime I'm, I stray here, Pete. Yeah. Um, Lana ha, had written the film in a, um, with a couple of collaborators that um, one was, that was the 
um, writer from who did Cloud Atlas, which was a, a book we turned into a, a feature film. And the, the, the three of them had got together and um, written this script over a period of months. And Lana wanted it to be uh, a bookend to, if you, that's a word I've just learned, um, to, the, to the Matrix. So we did, when they were writing it, and this stems from the script. So when you talk about the production design and the collaboration about it, like the Bible is the script. So when they were writing the, um, the script, they took into account what the feeling was they were trying to portray. And Lana wants the wanted wants and wanted resurrections to feel like the Matrix and to be in the Matrix and to delve deeper into the rabbit hole that they set up on the Matrix of what the Matrix world is. And so when they were writing the script, they developed that plot and storyline. So when we started designing the film. Um, we had that the, the script to go by, and then we had as reference the the first film, and really the Matrix was the reference for Resurrections. Um, we changed a few things, like you know, in it's many years since. So Lana wanted to inject a bit of colour and a bit of difference and a bit of uh, more dynamic action. So I don't know whether that answers the question. But it all stems from that first reading of the script and the idea when your director stands in a room and says, this is how I want this to actually be, that you start that day and, and the road takes you all different places, you know. But, you know, as I've said before, with Lana and Lily on the, the films, you, they know where they want to go. And, and so... We knew as soon as we got the script and, and we read it, and I can't tell you now because you haven't seen the film, but the opening sequences of the films are, are based on their first ideas that they want people to be in the matrix. Mm. Yeah, uh, interesting that you talk about uh, Lana and her uh, knowing where she wants to go. Is that kind of what has kept you, uh, both of you, uh, working with her and collaborating on multiple projects? Um, or is there anything got, else? No. Um, when Lana when Lana rings up and says, "I want to do a movie. Do you want to come and do it?" I generally say yes. yes. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. It's simple. Stuff. Period. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And, and well, we you know we you know uh, it was a long time ago. I first did the, when I first met them on the first Matrix. So mm. I've um, done. Uh, besides a couple of films they produced that they didn't direct, I've done um, all their shows since. So it, it's not really a choice, you know? I mean... I mean, just, both of us have worked with other people. It's just that we're lucky enough to get the call to come back and, and we make ourselves available because we want to work with her because it's mm. great. Creatively, it's really cool. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, uh, we have a question from Carly here. Uh, she's asking, what is the typical day to day work schedule as a production designer when when getting ready for a shoot? You know, if you can particularly uh, particularly with a film like this one with that big of a scale. Well, we get in about 12. We have a bit of lunch. We walk around. We see a few people. And then we go home about two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't do much in the day not much in the day it's it, it, but i tell you what like i wish you wish some days were like that pete but yeah, yeah. um i, I, think, I think you go God. first but i'll I no, just I start think... by saying you know like by the end of most days at work after you do your 12 hours if someone asks you to remember what you did yeah in that 12 hours with you know 13 different departments, 50 scenic artists, 120 carpenters, five art directors, and various other people. If you can remember what you did in that day, then you didn't do enough. Yeah. Mm. 
And on top of that, there's sometimes some political stuff that you're dealing with production, um, pouring oil on troubled waters, um, <laughs> um, you know, putting little fires out everywhere. And uh, yeah, mm. I, I would concur with you. If you get to the end of the day um, and can remember, then um, yeah, it's not been a very busy day. Mm. Uh, for This is from uh, Emmanuel. Uh, this is for you. Uh, since you worked on the trilogy, were you surprised to get a call for a fourth film since most end in trilogies and how, particularly with how the trilogy ended? Or did you know that that was going to happen sooner or later, the, the fourth film? No, no, no. After um, no, that was sort of put to bed after um, Revolutions, Lana wanted to um, move on and, and so did mm -hmm. Lily. So they didn't think about it for um, for some time, and they moved into different areas. Uh, like you know, Sense Eight was a big thing for both Lana and Nilly, and um, various other shows. They'd sort of put it right on the back burner. But the good thing for Pete and myself is that after we had done uh, work with them for a while, we just continued to do those other projects. And as Pete said, we've both done projects outside the realm of the Wachowskis. But um, uh, all of a sudden, Lana um, one day had woke up and she'd had a bit of, um, you know, had a, a loss of a couple of, uh, like her parents in a short period of time. And that affected her greatly because they're very close family. Uh, and one day she um, got up and thought the best thing she should do is like to help heal herself and and bring her you know just within her own you know psyche um she thought she just woke up one morning and thought i think i might make another matrix film um and there's a, and lana's like a fairly clever person and uh she articulates very well much better than i do um but once she decided that it was a good idea to do it um, then it just sort of becomes a fait accompli. So it was a great uh, um, well, period when she started talking about it again because it became quite exciting. Even though we hadn't had a script, she just rang one Peter and one day and then me a little later on and told uh, how she had come up with this idea in the middle of the night. Um, and so then she wanted to do it. So... No, they never planned it years ago. It was, um, that was it, mm -hmm. move on. But the Matrix world has existed in comics and the Matrix world has existed in anime and, and various things. So it's, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't a great surprise that sooner or later, um, while everyone was still capable and the actors were, were still keen, that we did another one. It wasn't, it wasn't a total surprise. Mm. Got it. Uh, Peter, anything you would like to add to that? No, no, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm absolutely same as here. Got it. Yeah. Um, so here we uh, have a lot of people in here looking for uh, to find their way into the industry. And, you know, the CSUEA, uh, who I work for, helps with people transitioning from campus to career. And we have a lot of people that would love to hear about what are some of the various entry points into the production designing world? You know, how do you break into that industry? If you want to do it and you're passionate enough, then you will. Uh, mm -hmm. If you can't be bothered to get out of bed in the morning or struggling to work when you're not feeling too great, then, you know, this isn't for you. Um, you've got to, in my, my opinion, uh, really want to do it. Um, um, I think there are different ways in, um, almost per perhaps even depending on what country that you, that you live in. Um, I think that some people will go to university and come out um, and maybe go in at a different level than than some others. Um, I, I don't think you can knock going in at the bottom um, and working your way through the art department. Um, you may circumvent the, the, the complete bottom and, and, and go in a, in a middle position perhaps. But somebody said to me the other day, the, the easiest thing in our industry is actually to give up. The mm. hardest thing is to carry on, keep working, even from the beginning of getting into it and completely persevering 
And even when you've been in it for like a year or so, and then you can't get a job for a couple of months and you become despondent, if you give up, then you're not really cut out to do the business anyway. If you carry on and you persevere and you just don't give up, then then you'll 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 succeed. Mm. You know, that, that's mm. what I think. Yeah, I think um, I, I, I think Ed, personally, you can get into, as Pete just said, in different different levels. But one of the things you need these days, and, and it doesn't matter which country you're in for this, is you need education. Mm. Now, I was lucky. I, you know, I'm fortunate to be sitting here talking to you today, but I don't think if you followed the path that I have followed to get to this point that you would be able to particularly do it these days. Um, to get into an art department in a design area, you need to have great computer skills. You need to know software programs. You need to know how to design things. Um, there's a big difference between being a technician and being a designer. You need to, uh, you know, you need to have a, some other skills. But the one thing you do need is educational skills. You can't really get a foot in the door in an art department, I know these days, in design or set design, unless you have done some sort of architectural course or some sort of film course that you come in and you have skills. You know, 30 years ago, we didn't have, we didn't design anything on a computer. It was all drawing board and it was seat of the pants. Different in England. Pete's been in the English film industry for forever, right? So he knows the English system, whereas I've been in the Australian system for the first 20 years of my working life, which is totally different. But now when a, and a show comes to Australia to, to come in, you can't just be a guy off or a girl off the street who says, I really want to work in film. You mm -hmm. have to get yourself educated and have some drive, you know, and you may not get the job you want first off. You might not get the job you want for the first 15 years. But mm -hmm. unless you get educated, you're pretty much, you know, behind yeah. the eight ball. You have to take something to the table with you when you go for that interview, whether it's, whether it's, you know, Photoshop, whether it's Rhino, whether it's, you know, uh, some computer skill or, or even, even drawing, you know, by hand. Um, um, you, you have to have something to offer. Um, I think Hugh and I were slightly, I don't know if lucky is the right word. I mean, um, uh, our entry was very different to what people do nowadays. And even if you're going in as a runner, you're more likely to get the position if you have something to offer rather than go, I've never done this before, but I'm sure I can photocopy, you know. Not saying that, you know, if you can charm your way in, then good luck to you, but Hugh's right. You have to take something along that you can offer. Mm, okay, yeah, that's very interesting because uh, you know, a lot of days you hear about the stories of people coming in and it's a lot about, you know, I happen to meet the right people, I happen to be in the right room. So uh, I, that's interesting that you, you know, preach education. And I love that. I but. think, I think that was the case 30 or 40 years ago. I'm mm -hmm. not quite so sure that that happens now. Less so today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is that, um, it, it could still uh, happen, but you would have to have the, the skill levels, uh, uh, uh really normal. high, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. competition is phenomenally high you know like the, the set designers we had in berlin you know um and the art directors like i couldn't do any of the stuff they could do you know i was just you know fortunate enough that i was in a position by then to be able to hire the best people around to make me look good but um the the skill level of that art department in both san francisco and and um and Berlin was enormous, was phenomenal. And, and same on shows like that they do in England. Uh, you know, they pump out these big feature films and the, they just are really skillful people. It's not, it's not seedy pants stuff, really. I mean, the film industry has changed in terms of how, you know, these tent poles, like um, 
the Marvel Universe, look, what they knock out, you know, um, and, and, and they're sort of, well, they're a bit like a factory, but, you know, um, you wouldn't get a job in any of those art departments if you'd walk in and go, well, I really, you know, I'm really keen to work in the film industry. That That's not going to cut it these days. Education, education, education. There you go. There you go. Here we have a question from Armando. Yes. What are some things you wish you knew before you started your careers? Uh, and what don't people realize about what it is you do that you'd like people to know? Um, I was so ignorant when I started that um, I was just happy to have the job. Um, um, and I picked it up as I've gone along. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I can't answer that question because I don't know what I would have wanted. Looking back, you know, what, what would have made it any different, really? Is, that was the question, wasn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, I, but, I, I, yeah go on. And I was just going to say another another part of that question uh, is maybe, you know, what don't people know about your job or realize about it that you'd like people to know? It beats working for a living. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if, yeah, it does. It's not, as, it's not as glamorous as people think it is. You know, um, I have spent the majority of my married life traveling around the world without my wife and family. Um, we've made it work and it's been an incredible time. Um, but when I meet people who don't know anything about the industry and they say, oh, it, you know, God, that must be so exciting. It must be fantastic. You know, are you living in hotels? Well, you know, you try living in a hotel for six months of, you know, a year and not seeing your family and, 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 and it's winter and it's Romania and it's not great. And, you know, it, it, it's, I love what we do and I would never change it, but it ain't as glamorous as people think it is. And, and that's what I, I sometimes get a bit frustrated over is they don't, and no, neither should they, you know, and he's the same, you know, um, he leaves Australia and, and doesn't see the rest of his family. And, and very often he's much further away from them than I am from mine. At least sometimes I can commute. But yeah, it's 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 not as glamorous as you think it is, especially when you're getting up at four o'clock in the morning um, and it's cold and it's wet and, you know, and things maybe not be going quite so well and you've got to sort a problem out and uh, and 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 you're still there, you know, late into the afternoon and evening. Yeah. Yeah, these, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't give, you know, change my, where I am now, really, I don't think I could, but um, you've got to like to travel a little, you know, um, and you've got to be, uh, I think you've got to just want to go to the, I don't know what I'm trying to you say. Want to go to work. Get, That's it, yeah. You've got to go, it's such a good industry to be in i mean there's a lot of people in the industry that aren't as nice as they could be but the majority of people you meet are and majority of the people you meet really want to do the job and um uh, like we've worked with people now for years and years and years and on and off and you bump into them on one show and then you might not see them for like four or five years and then all of a sudden there's hey ralph hi sam how are you going, you know, and um, and you get a whole family of people in the film industry. One thing you, you don't have is uh, a lot of time with your family. I've travelled for all over the place, um, you know, since we did Reloaded. Um, and it comes with, you know, great experiences, but it can come with um, a lot of personal loss. You know, there's things you don't get when you work in the industry like we do. And as Peter just said, a lot of it is you, once you've had a family, you can be away from them. You know, I was away for a year on one job um, and I had two young grandchildren. So Skype and Zoom help that these days. Mm. But as Peter said, you know, you live in a hotel room for like 40 weeks in a year or in one particular year we worked, we lived in hotel rooms in like, 13 different cities in a year. Now that comes with people's idea that, wow, that's a glamorous job. That must be exciting. Yes, it is. It's great. And I wouldn't give it up for quids, but you have to know what you're getting yourself in, in for. It's a lot of hard work. 
the hours are hard, the hours are long, and the, and when you see a film and you go to the cinema, and I would just say what um, Nate said, make sure if you see Resurrections or when you see Resurrections, you see it at a cinema, it makes it worthwhile, you know? And I'm not sure that even answered the question either. No, you definitely answered the question many different times during that that answer. Uh, and yeah, I also I agree, like when you put as much effort as you do, you definitely would need to watch it. Yeah, as Jesse says here, in IMAX, in theaters, just because there's so much to experience. Um, here we have a question here from Matthew Magnus again. Uh, a favorite member, a memory that you'll always remember from your years uh, production designing at all? Um, I went to um, Revolution's premiere at the Disney Center in Los Angeles when the city allowed the Warner Brothers to make it green. And it was just a fabulous night. They hadn't, hadn't been open very long, the Disney Center, and it was like just going in there, the the crowds out the front at the red carpet, like this is a film moment, you know. I mean, I've had other good yeah. moments in my life, don't get me wrong, but as far as that film moment goes, that was pretty uh, out there. The Disney Center all green, the cars come out to the red carpet, the green carpet, the... And, and the lights and everybody just um, going in there and just the feeling of, because as I said, when we, you know, when you work for that long on three films, that was a big, that was a pretty big moment for me. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about Peter, yourself? Uh, completely sort of on the other uh, footing um, um, is I had always wanted to go to India um, and it's always, quite nice to be paid to go somewhere rather than having to pay yourself but mm -hmm. I've always loved the culture I, I loved the thought of working there um, and it lived up to every expectation when when we were on Sensei and we ended up in in Mumbai um, and that's something I, I won't forget because a I wanted to go there b I'd always wanted to go there and it was exactly as I thought it would be and the people are fantastic and it was not easy, but it was really, really um, exciting. Wow. There you go. Yeah. Uh, last two questions here. I don't want to take too much of your time now. Uh, we have a question from Isaac. What should a screenwriter be conscious of when writing with a production designer in mind? Hey. Um, I'm okay. not sure they should. I, think they, I, I, I don't think they should. I think they should write right. their script. Hmm. They should just write their script and get whatever they've got up here on paper. Yes, don't worry about what it looks like yet. Makes you know if you want to be a screenwriter, write the screen. Yeah, hey, we'll, you know, we'll do the best. We'll, yeah, we'll do the we'll best. We'll make it look good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Use your imagination and put it down on paper, and it'll turn into what you want. But um, you have to get, you know, and unless to make a good movie, you've got to have a good script. There's, you know, there's still the old adage: unless you've got a good script. You, no matter what you can do, you can't make a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, how about, uh, la again, last question here. Uh, do you, uh, both of you, have any upcoming projects you guys can talk about? Sorry? Uh, do you uh, have any upcoming projects that you'd like to talk about or uh, just, you know, bring up to the, to the audience before we go here? Uh, the only up and coming project I've got is a massive Christmas lunch with all of my family. And I'm looking yes. forward to that. I don't have any particular work lined up at the moment, um, but that's my biggest project. And um, that's what we're, we're working towards in the Walpole family. How about you, yourself, yeah. you? I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I just finished doing a film in Sydney with um, Russell Crowe directing and starring in it. Um, it'll come out next year called Poker Face. That was an interesting project. Um, but apart from that, I'm with Pete. This time of year is pretty much, get, uh, we don't have a Christmas tree yet, but we will by the end of today. But um, <clears throat> no, I think we just enjoy the moment with Resurrections um, and see how it goes. I'm very excited that it's got a release in China. Uh, and um, also, hey, 
HBO is really only an American centric platform. So the rest of the world will get to see it on the big screen. Whereas in America, you get the choice of HBO or the cinema. Now, in my world, if you've got the choice of HBO, Netflix, Prime, all those things, or the cinema, you take the cinema every time. Yep. 100%. Yeah. And also, yeah, good for, good for you guys. Everyone deserves to uh, take a break, be with their families during the holidays. So happy to hear that. And uh, without further ado, as you can see in the chat, everyone is thanking you all for your time. And I'd like to, you know, second that notion. Thank you so much on behalf of the CSU Entertainment Alliance and all of our students and faculty. Just another big thank you to uh, Nate Thomas for moderating the panel and to you and Peter for My giving honor. us their time. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, and, and also to Warner Brothers and uh, who also made this event happen. So thank you to everyone involved. For everyone watching, please be sure to check out the resources and opportunities from the CSUEA on our website, csuentertainment.com. And check us out on social media uh, for job postings, events, webinars like this one. Uh, at the CSUEA on all platforms, you know, if you want to show some love on there, whether it be on Instagram or Twitter, any types of posts like that, please go ahead and do it. We'd love to see it. And lastly, you know, go ahead and experience Matrix Resurrections and appreciate everything that it has to offer in theaters um, or on HBO Max, uh, December <laughs> no, on H or on HBO Max, December 22nd of this year. Um, <laughs> so, yes. Again, for the umpteenth time, thank you both. Thank you all Pleasure. for your thank time. Thank you all. Yes, and until Thanks next everyone. time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye, everybody. All right. See Happy you later. Holidays.